But we're going to have Hugh Dunn in uh, later uh, this morning to talk about this. What we do is we'll take a quick break and, and we'll be right back. A good thing to people that have these ailments. But the way the law is written, this can just transfer or transform into a place where anybody who's over 21 can show up and buy marijuana. And I don't think that is exactly what people have been uh, sold. I, I don't think that that's been the um, perception here. So, and, and so that uh, inspired me to write a letter to the uh, Committee on Marijuana Policy. And this letter is not um, uh, questioning the legality of Question 4, recreational marijuana. The voters have decided that uh, affirmatively. And, you know, as an elected official, my role is to make sure that the will of the voters is uh, executed in a responsible manner. And and that's what this letter is trying to do. It's trying to, um, it's asking that the state uh, give local municipal officials the tools necessary to properly regulate the sale of recreational marijuana. And local officials are really the right people for this job. We know the most about local public safety, public health concerns. We know the neighborhoods. We know the neighbors. We know the businesses that will be impacted. So um, I think it's only it's only fair. And it, it, it beyond fair, it, it's just it would uh, be in line with the history of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. These types of decisions, government is... Uh, made off of uh, local people providing input to their elected officials and making their decisions. That's how things are supposed to operate. And that's sure. not how this law is written. Yeah, because f- f- so that folks understand, you can, you can regulate recreational marijuana in a community unless you have already have a medical facility in place. It, if you have a medical facility in place, you have given up your right to prevent the sale of recreational marijuana at that location. It's, it's a cute trick. I mean, it's, it's a genius mm-hmm. tactic, the way they wrote the ballot question. And also, I get that people say we voted on it and it should be the way it is, but the true length of the process is the legislature gets the last look at the right. ballot referendum. In California, they don't, but in Massachusetts, they do. It's, it's, not, it's not a unique situation here. This has been done. Some things I didn't appreciate, they, they, they made changes to the tax laws, the rollback of the income tax right. years ago. The legislature said we can't afford to do it. It was an irresponsible vote. So this, uh, and all you're asking is that the legislature take a look at this essential monopolistic component. Right. That, and, and, and because that's the only way the city of New Bedford can get any control over this, correct? Correct. Uh, the, the alternative here is to uh, have the city vote to entirely ban the sale of recreational marijuana. And that's not what I'm asking for in this letter. I'd just like the city to be able to have some say in whether uh, a medical dispensary can transform into something that's entirely different, a recreational dispensary. Right. And uh, and even if the city did decide to pass a ban on recreational, they still couldn't ban it at, at the medical facility the way the law is written today. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's again, it's genius. I, I spoke to an attorney friend of mine as I was reading the law, and, he, and I said, I characterize it as a loophole, and he reminded me it's not a loophole. It's the entire intention of the law that, that it was done this way to, uh, to ensure that. And also, as you can see, like Marty Walsh in the city of Boston, he's concerned that all the surrounding suburbs of Boston will ban recreational pot and that everyone will be going to New Bedford, uh, everyone will be going to Boston to get their, their recreational marijuana. Uh, and I think New Bedford probably has to have those same concerns. Absolutely. And, and you see other municipalities. It's not just Boston. I believe Marshfield just uh, uh, outright voted uh, to ban uh, recreational marijuana, and this issue uh, spurred that on. And and other municipalities are weighing in on this. The Mass Municipal Association uh, has written uh, policy pieces on this. So this is a statewide issue. And and, and what you're asking for is just to return a a little bit more local control to the city of New Bedford. Right. Okay. Um, All right, talk to me a little bit about... uh, What's going on up the road in, in your ward at the golf course uh, with this uh, rollout of, of an economic development zone over there? What, what's going on with that? So this is a pretty exciting development uh, for New Bedford. Uh, the numbers that we're talking about are 1,000 jobs and uh, $2 million in uh, tax revenue uh, on an annual basis. And what this is is redeveloping a part of that golf course uh, the, the project would maintain uh, the historic nine-hole golf course 
and then develop the remaining part of that parcel uh, for a business park. And, you know, as an economic development uh, practitioner, uh, I, I immediately recognize that there aren't many uh, 100 acre plus greenfield right. type spaces in the state uh, left to do this. So we would immediately attract companies to New Bedford with this type of, of asset. Also, New Bedford's business park is almost fully tenanted. I believe we have one parcel left. So having this conversation now about where to land businesses in the future is is much more appropriate than waiting till we have that piece taken and say, hey, wait a minute, where where we'd like more businesses, but where do we put them? Right. So um, so this this agreement is uh, it's still in its infancy, and there still has to be a lot of public input. And I've encouraged that the administration, as well as Mass Development, uh, host a public forum because. There hasn't been a lot of transparency with the rollout of this project, and I was only able to get details on the project uh, one day before the announcement. But after reading uh, the details that were given to me, I immediately thought it's a good idea. And some of the reasons I think that's a good idea is because the parcel has access to two highways. It's near the waterfront. You have freight uh, rail near there. It's already hooked up with sewer. And and it's not contaminated to uh, to my knowledge. So I think that you could see this parcel be uh, converted uh, pretty quickly. But the timeline that uh, I have heard is that it's going to be an 18-month process. People will be able to golf uh, using the entire course uh, this year, next year. And and, and I think that... Um, You're talking about the permitting and, and, the, and, and the, the due diligence on right. this? Right. Okay. Right. And nothing's happening overnight on this. And again, it's still at a proposal at a proposal phase. Also, this project has the uh, potential to um, mitigate something that has been a constant um, uh, public safety issue in Ward three, which is the hotel on half on Hathaway. Every day you see our first responders responding to some uh, some issue, whether it's a overdose or some uh some other criminal some criminal act and this gun i've seen people arrested for guns over there illegal firearms right yeah drugs. Uh, interesting story during my law school graduation uh the fairfield was booked and we put my sister at that location she ended up sleeping on my couch that night uh, she couldn't stay the night no no so um so I, you know, I've, I think it's time that we do something about that. Right. But this golf course uh, redevelopment could kind of change the dynamic there and bring in a different clientele. And um, so I'm hopeful for that. But I, the most important thing here is is growing the pie. We need to be forward looking. Uh, New Bedford has a lot of uh, of expenses and uh, an efficient city government takes money you know, we have to right. uh, we have to pay all these folks that uh that make uh, uh that provide us with a good quality of life and so the additional two million will will really be essential to help improve our schools you know we'll have safer neighborhoods uh our fire department and police department i would assume will get more resources mm -hmm. and the quality of life will continue to improve and it'll provide more jobs and that right. that job calculation is based off of one job for every 1000 i believe it's square feet of uh of real estate that they can operate a business on okay and, and i think that the businesses that we should be looking at are advanced manufacturing life sciences this region already has um a cluster related to medical device manufacturing so okay. we could build on that but also we can just do warehouses and distribution. And so there, I'd like to see New Bedford folks have a uh, priority at those jobs though. And I think that, you know, if we do uh, TIFs, that, that conversation can occur there. Um, Which is tax incremental financing deals. And those basically, you you give a break, for those people who don't, don't understand exactly, you give a break on property taxes uh, in exchange for them making a commitment to create X number of jobs. Right, right. Um, and I, I also have a, a decent level of confidence in this project because of Mass Development being okay. a partner in this project. And you've worked with them th right. through your job out at, U at UMass. Right. Um, Mass Development has an excellent track record. The Miles Standish Business Park is a great example of that. And I believe in fiscal year 14, they spurred on 6.9 uh, – no, it's $2.9 billion in economic development and uh, have – correlated that with uh, 6,300 jobs. So wow. they, 
they've been at in this game for a while, and I think they're the right partner for the project. Yeah, I remember when you spoke when I spoke with you when this first was announced. Uh, you and I spoke, you know, uh, obviously off the air, and you said no that you had a lot of confidence in Mass in, in, right. in, in that organization, and and that <clears throat> if the questions that were being uh, that were arising, you felt that pretty confident that they'd be able to handle yeah handle this project. Yeah, and, and I definitely uh, uh, have uh, concerns about how this will impact uh, the neighborhoods around there with traffic, but they're going to be doing numerous traffic studies. And, and I think that uh, when they come and, and present uh, to the folks in the neighborhoods that they'll be able to address these questions much better than I can. Um, yeah. And, and you, you know, you, you hit on a couple of points that are, that are important. Number one, the, the lack of uh, pollution there, which is rare, unfortunately mm -hmm. for, for older industrial cities, there's just a lot of hazardous waste and uh, leftover uh, industrial, uh, you know, waste that's that's all over the place in, right. in cities like New Bedford, and New Bedford's not unique in that. And so, and then the other piece is that that it's a large contiguous piece of land that mm -hmm. is very rare in the city of New Bedford, but rare in Massachusetts now. Right, right. And so you'll be able to. So, so the plan is, if I'm understanding this correctly, you're going to do an overlay. You're going to lay the, the city and the, and the state will lay this out, and then go out to the market to try to bring companies in. Correct. Yeah. And, and and the thing the thing that I like about this is the jobs aspect of it. It's weird to me that in here in Greater New Bedford, southeastern Massachusetts, we're praying for a train so that you can commute four hours a day to the city of Boston to work. I've done that. It's it's miserable. It's a miserable way to either we're driving or taking a train. We ought to be able to live and work within twenty minutes of of your house. Right. Right? I I don't think that's asking too much. Right. Well, with the with the train, uh, my day job at the South Coast Development Partnership has been advocating for rail access. It's I, I believe that will be a great economic development driver, but it's also a matter of uh, of equity and in state investment. Uh, I believe that this region has been passed over for quite a while, uh, three decades uh, regarding the train. And uh, and our position on that is that we would like to see service uh, three stops. Uh, in the a.m. peak period and the p.m. peak periods uh, in New Bedford, Fall River, and Taunton. But we'd, we we want to see one seat uh, ride to Boston of 90 minutes or less. If it creeps up above an hour and a half, that's not really commuter service. That's not that's not helping our people get to work. That's right. just uh, that's that's uh, that's a bit less than than what we deserve as a region. So uh, but I'm actually confident that this project's moving along because We've identified a way to provide rail at uh, at a much reduced cost from the initial um, the initial proposal, which was going through a swamp, cutting right through Easton, uh, all sorts of uh, environmental hangups there. This will take existing freight uh, freight lines, upgrade them, and connect them to the Middleboro route. Uh, is it ideal? No, but I think that it's a step in the right direction, and we can push for upgrades to that route as we go forward. Yeah, and, and look, if you if people want to take the train, I've I've had to take the train, I've driven, I've tried it every way you can do it, taking the bus, I've done it every way you can in into Boston. No matter what, it's still a long, long, long uh, trip, and you can't. Uh, it's it, it impacts your quality of life, you know. So so yeah. we need to have jobs in this area, good good paying jobs where people can. You know, where it's twenty minutes, so you, Absolutely. You, you can go see a kid's baseball game. You can you can go out and do something in the evening, uh, after work. Because yep. if you're again, <clears throat> not to make it all about me, but it really is you all about me. <laughs> um, when you're commuting back and forth to Boston, that's all you do. You're, right. you're either in the car, you get home, it's it's it, you eat dinner, you go to bed, because you got to get up two hours early and to get there. Um, and when I I'm in Boston oftentimes early in the morning to do a radio program, and I'm coming home. It's still before noon. Say like, I mean, I'll be coming home. I'll be southbound at nine thirty in the morning, and the cars are backed up to Brockton. Right. On twenty four, it's just and I can I feel bad for those people sitting in that traffic. Um. So and we're gonna have to do something about it. But again, it's all if you can create jobs here in the city of New Bedford. That's Absolutely. that's the best thing, right? Yeah, that's the that's the way to go about it is to uh, demand investment from the state. But also build uh, build our own uh, foundation of jobs and uh, address our uh, unemployment rates locally. So a combination of those two items is the way that New Bedford gets to move forward. Hey, look, just um, 
we'll get you, we'll get you here for about another 10 minutes or so, five minutes or so. Uh, how, how do you like in the job so far? Oh, I love the job. Uh, you know, I went to UMass Law School. Uh, I was attracted to this law school because of its interest on, uh, its focus on public interest. And I had uh, interned prior uh, to that in, in different public offices. And I, I really am interested in, in helping uh, individuals improve their lives. And I think that's what government should be doing. Um, and so this job has really allowed me to, to bring my skill set to mm-hmm. the city council. And I think that one of the key things is economic development, and I get to focus on that. And so this is a very fulfilling job, uh, and I'm, I'm really honored to, uh, to serve. And it's, it's been a great experience so far. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and you're, you've, you came into office at an interesting time. I mean, I think the city is is really on the ascendancy. Absolutely, I, I, I really do. I, I think it's just uh, it's got its problems. Every city has its problems. I think this this crime stuff needs to get. Absolutely. Yeah, this is very concerning. Needs to get worked out. Um, but I think the people causing the problem, they're not interested in, in helping New Bedford. They're not interested in whether there are jobs here or not. Right. They, they're interested in chaos and disorder, and they're, they're not part of the pro. I mean, they're not, they're not interested at all in, in, in helping move the city forward. Right, and I, I do think that uh, as a city, we need to come together and, and be very uh, forceful in our response to uh, the recent criminal acts because if, if we are complacent on this, you will see crime... Uh, uh, not necessarily skyrocket, but it will increase throughout the summer. And, you know, one uh, one stabbing or shooting will lead to another. And, th- and that's not the trajectory that New Bedford needs. That's right. that's not that's that's not what we're here to do. And that that really isn't representative of New Bedford as a whole. I think you have a lot of people that love the city, a lot of local pride, yes. a lot of people that are investing in the city. And so to allow these acts to overshadow that is is not a good thing, but we cannot ignore the uh, the recent uh, uh, criminal acts. It's it, it's something that we need to really come together. We need to engage not only just law enforcement, our our public schools, the university, uh, South Coast Health. Uh, all the partners need to come together and figure out what to do here and be vigilant. We have and the to, jails. Let's not forget about the jails, Hugh. That's really the answer. We need to put these people in jail. Well, one thing is that we need to uh, better educate uh, better educate our uh, the judges that are seeing these individuals. Um, it seems like our law enforcement officers are doing a great job. Mm-hmm. They are arresting these individuals, but. Uh, the judges let them out the next day. And I feel like that's uh, a lack of connection with the community. Uh, they don't really understand. Or maybe it's just a perception that out-of-town judges have of New Bedford. Hey, let them go. New Bedford's full of criminals anyway. That's not the truth. Right. Uh, no, not at all. So I think that we need to really look at uh, how the judges are serving us and if they're really doing the, the best job that they could for this city. I think – I. I 100% agree with you, and I think that from, from everybody in the city recognizes this, that, that the police are doing a fantastic job. They're, they're, they're locking up these impact players, and they're right back on the street. The judges right. are the, – the judges are – I don't know. I, I, it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I, I, I can't wrap my head around it. But also the police are doing a, a, a great proactive job with, uh, with community policing and the High Five Fridays and really engaging the community. And I think that that's going to pay uh, dividends going forward. Hey, Hugh, I want to thank you for coming into the studio uh, this morning with us. This is your first time here on Sunday Brunch. We'll, we'll have you back real soon. Uh, and I'm glad you're enjoying the job. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. Thanks. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back. Uh, and you can give us a call at 508-996-0500. Thanks for watching. And if you uh, would like to get more videos like this, please uh, hit hit the subscribe button below uh, on the WBSM channel. Subscribe to WBSM, and that way you'll always get the latest videos here from Sunday Brunch and the other wonderful programs on WBSM.